Okay, I think we're on, Mikkel. It's so good to meet you. <laughs> it's a real uh, pleasure it's, to meet you too, Kate. Uh, such a pleasure to read your book, Hollywood Park. Uh, I was telling them before you came on that uh, when I went to the bookstore, I called the bookstore, they said, we are uh, almost out, but we have one copy left, and I went and got it. So I was oh, wow. delighted to get the last copy. Oh, that's um, really flattering. Thank you. Uh, it was very exciting. Um, so I, I want to to start with uh, the, the first question that came to me as I, as I read this. And, and I, uh, I teach creative writing. I, I often teach memoir writing. And uh, I actually have just finished a memoir. And in fact, yesterday, my, wow. <laughs> my, uh, my agent started sending it out. And it is also about my experience. Of, I lived at a cult until I was 18. So I oh did not God. Did not get out as soon as you did. Um, the cult was started in in the '60s in New Hampshire, um, and I always think that a lot of people's cult experiences involve drugs and sex. And mine was much more a, a very uh, right wing religious cult. Wow. Um, that, well, first and, of all, congratulations on finishing the memoir. That's amazing. What an amazing accomplishment. Well, thank you. Yes, as you know, it um, sounds like it, we have a lot to talk about. Yeah, we do. We do. Um, <laughs> but what, so one of the 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 things I talk about with students is that I, I think I as someone who has written in a lot of different genres, I write librettos to operas, I write poetry, and I write fiction, I think of memoirs as the most difficult. And part of it is that you have to go back into a dark place. Um, because generally when you're writing memoirs, you're not I mean, maybe if you were an ice skater or a famous Hollywood celebrity, maybe you had some great fun times, but many of us who write memoirs are writing them about dark times. Yeah. And the other problem with memoirs is that some of those people that you're writing about are still in your life. Oh and man, that, that's a big issue, yeah. That complicates things. Sure. Um, and uh, I think about how when Jonathan Franzen uh, wrote corrections how one of the characters apparently is loosely based on his brother and that felt a little complicated but he of course told his brother it's only loosely based on you right, right. But a memoir is your life and 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 so you know your parents of course are in there your your siblings are going to be in there and that isn't the story they would have told it's never going to be exactly the story they would have told yeah. and um and then so that there's there's the there's that complication, the other people. But then for me, the biggest part and the reason it took me 12 years to write it is that you have to go down, down, down those stairs into this, into this dark place where you were. And one of the things when you were a child is you couldn't, you couldn't fight for yourself. And you Absolutely. have to remember what it was like being that little person that couldn't fight for yourself. Yeah. So what, what was this like for you? I think you described it really well. <laughs> I, I think this, the, um, first of all, I, I think the, the idea of memoir as one of two things sort of classically, I think we're, we, it's those of us who love books and love literary memoirs and just love literature, I think understand this very broad understanding of memoir. And you think of anything from like, I know why the caged bird sings to Angela's ashes to, you know, um, Glass Castle. Um, Mary Carr, I think, has written three memoirs. Um, one about being sober, one about just being drunk, and then one about being a kid. And she's uh, she's in the Mount Rushmore of, of memoir writing, I think. Um, and and I, I sort of I find that school of sort of modern literary memoir thinking to be kind of where I'm from. That's that's what I. Those are the books I enjoy most because there's this classical understanding of it. there's a. It's either autobiography or it's like disaster porn. It's either mm -hmm. like you know, uh, filled with mind numbing, you know, dates and degrees. And then this happens and you're like, you know, what's the, the education of Henry Adams or something like, like where it's just like, okay, I don't care. And you have to be like a diplomat, you know, or a head of state or something like that. Um, 
and uh it, and it's also i think kind of a different way of hiding because you don't really know the person you don't know their experience uh and uh and then the other is just uh, emotional disaster porn which is just like and then i was dragged by my face behind the truck for 50 miles and then when i got there i fell in a puddle and they kicked me in the face with a boot and now i'm fine and you're like bullshit you're not fine yeah. i need you to i need you to interrogate this and i want to know more about you know where there's just these descriptions of these horrific events and, and as a reader there that's popcorn right you're just like then what happened then what happened and you know but but i feel like the books that i like most uh in memoir take a more literary bet and i, I wanted to take that and they, they interrogate they they think through okay what was what was sort of um uh what made you stronger about this horrific mm -hmm. event uh, and also put me in this event. Don't just describe it. And also, what was this sort of, what was the ontological reality of this event? What is, what is this event in your memory as you question it, as you write about it, uh, as being sort of a piece of dialogue between the adult writer and the child who went through it? And how, what is your feelings on that? And unpack those. And I feel like that's kind of the turf of literature. Um, and I, um, that's why I think I've been so, so drawn to, to the genre. Right, because you're you are allowing your reader to climb out with you. Yeah, um, and and to a certain extent, your reader is finding out that not everybody climbs out. Right, um, absolutely. And and I think that um, as as the reader, they want to understand how you climbed out, and not everyone climbs out. Um, I'm assuming this is true of you, but um, the cult where I grew up, um, there are a number of people who managed to leave but in their mind they're still there totally um, understand that 100 percent right. rings true i know so many people or elements of it are still there or there's just right. it's kind of like unpacked trauma you know you can tell if someone's yeah. like got just carrying around the trauma you're like gotta get on the couch man <laughs> like you're this upset about this little thing there's something else here and you gotta go talk about it like i to some extent i think there that that's what's that's what's happening there is just this kind of like unpacked uh trauma of it on that subject, um, do you feel that, for the most part, those of us who have spent time at a cult um, are damaged? Oh, I think everyone's damaged, and then everyone's in various stages of healing from that damage. Right. You know, right. I, I, what's funny is I feel like my book is filled with all these kind of like sexy terms of dad in prison and heroin addiction and death, and there's and alcoholism and a cult and violence and guns and living on the run and, and all those things did happen um but i feel like um those weren't really the hardest things the mm -hmm. hardest things were were things like loneliness the hardest mm -hmm. things were things like neglect the hardest things were uh these very banal things that i think there are plenty of people mm -hmm. you know emersonian like the masses of men masses of women living lives of quiet suffering in in mm -hmm. the suburbs who are going through similar feelings of neglect and loneliness and and shame and sadness and trauma based on these kind of emotional worlds that they have to navigate because they have people in their lives that are either addicts or perhaps they um uh, someone's mentally ill or perhaps uh, some horrible tragedy has fallen befallen the family and and you know these these um these things i think are actually very very common i just happen to have gone through it in these like for me anyway in my life these very sort of you could splash a headline across it says like cult survivor or whatever but like I, I don't know if that was really the hardest thing the hardest thing was just having no one to talk to or being five and being sick and just there's no one there or whatever it is right. and and i think there's plenty of people in the suburbs who from the outside you would look and say god that's a nice house and they seem like nice people and they're living lives of quiet suffering and so i think in that way you know that's the proper attitude of the writer whether you're making literature or doing fiction, nonfiction, that this sense that, that there, there's a relatability and a humanity. And if you're always digging for that humanity, if you're always digging for that contradiction, if you're digging for that empathy, digging for the truth of the story, um, then it becomes relatable because, gosh, we all carry around different forms of trauma and healing, you know, whether even if it looks really, really sexy on a book or not. No, I, I, I like that. I, you know, I've read different pieces of this book while I was working on it, my, my book, and, and also I've written poetry about it. And one of the things that I've been amazed by is how many people will say, um, you know, the cult that I grew up in was, was patriarchal, run by 
you know, I, a man, a David Koresh like man. And people will say to me that they the house they grew up in was a patriarchal miniature little cult. Um, so one of the, the questions that um, we were all interested in is, and, and I, I think about this myself, the, the differences between different kinds of writing, but, but you also, of course, write song lyrics. Um, and, and so when you uh, switch genres from the song lyrics to writing this, um, how did it feel different, easier, harder, different? Um, oh, wow. Well, so I'd written a bunch uh, before I started the band. Um, I was a writer. I was a, I was a columnist on All Things Considered and NPR. I'd written some fiction that found its way to McSweeney's. Um, I'd written a ton of essays. I was a columnist on uh, men's health. Uh, wrote about, you know, lots of, I wrote a column called Physics for Poets that was all about, like, you know, the way science and technology was changing questions of what it means to be human. And I'd done a lot of writing, like a lot. Um, and uh, I actually left... I, I, I turned down the, the residency I was offered at Yaddo uh, to start the band because I'd met a drummer. They offered me a two month spot at Yaddo to finish this novel I was working on. And I was like, no, I met a drummer. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember I had people that were in my life that were, it was like telling someone you were gonna join a circus. I was like, ah, I'm gonna start a rock band. And there was this, there was a feel like, I'm gonna go become a, a knife thrower. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to finish that book and I'm not going to follow up with the NPR stuff. I'm just going to go, uh, start, you know, wrestle bears. Um, and, um, so and then I went and spent, you know, 10 years in a rock band touring and living on a bus and writing songs. And it was great. It was great fun. And, you know, really, um, overwhelming experiences that were wonderful that I think, you know, are some of my most treasured experiences that I've had outside of like my family life in my whole life. Um, and then, um, and then when I decided to write the memoirs after my father died and I went through this like crazy depression for like six or eight months and just in um, uh, such grief, I was so sad. And I, I didn't know until this happened how confusing grief is. Like gr grief is just confusing. It's like a tear in the fabric of the space time continuum and it's just nothing makes sense. Um, and, and it was like, I was trying to make sense of how sad I was and make sense of like, how can the world be without my dad in it? How that doesn't even make sense. That, that, that's the world. The world has my dad. It's always had my dad. It's, you know, um, so uh, when I when I finally sat down to write, um, in some ways, it was sort of a return to, you know, what I had done for years before. Um, and I'd always known I was going to write. Um, I'd, I'd eventually return to writing. Um, and so uh, it was very different life. First thing I, the first thing that hit me was when musicians talk about work, nah, nah, it's not work the way writing is work. It's, it's like, it's work. I mean, you have to be somewhere and do a thing and then leave, but you know, uh, the like, just the scholastic, the sheer intellectual heft it takes to write a book, a serious book, um, uh, surprised me and humbled me and scared me and, really bum me out, you know, and, uh, the day to day, I, th I think I read somewhere once someone said writing a book is like crossing the Atlantic in a hot tub. Uh, just the, my process, which is I, I would, I write four hours a day with the, you know, when I read four hours a day, typically that's my day, four hours of writing, four hours of reading, maybe an hour or two of editing with a word, with a word count goal. And then, you know, then go and cut 80% of it <laughs> later when you decide it wasn't good enough. Uh, and so it was, it was just a tremendous amount of work and it was a labor of love. I, I, I spent a lot of time with, with my dad and my head and a lot of time with my brother and with my mom and just, uh, people that weren't around anymore. And, and, um, another great line about memoir writing. I think this is actually Mary Carr. She says, one of the great things about writing a memoir is you can spend time with people who aren't around anymore. And, uh, so there was a lot of tears shed as I was writing and it was just a big overwhelming experience that I just decided to do. And I didn't have any, I didn't have an agent. I didn't have a publisher. I didn't have, I just wrote the book and the the word document is not that different from the, the final page. Like I just, I just sat here for three years doing it. Uh, and it was, um, it was just incredibly hard. <laughs> I hope that's not discouraging to anyone. But no, that's, no, it was incredibly I... difficult. It was just like a lot of work, and I did. I did find that over time, I liked the kind of more um, academic existence, and that I'd sort of missed it. And that one of the thing about music is it's really fun, but it doesn't challenge your brain in the very sort of satisfying ways uh, that writing does. 
Yeah, I would agree with you that writing is living the life of mind. And um, when you're out doing events, uh, I remember someone saying to me at one point, I want to be a writer. And I said, what do you like about writing? And he said this. And he meant this part where you're out doing events. Oh, God. I was just, <laughs> and you really should be an actor or something. Yeah. You know? go, go to Broadway. Go. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't it. Do you this like writing? It. Oh, do you like sitting alone in a room and staring at a computer screen while your brain is very heavily concentrating on something? Because that's the life of a writer. Right. Do you and enjoy like, quiet days, six days a week for years on end? <laughs> yeah, for years on end with nobody looking at your work, nobody interested oh. in doing, people wishing you would come out of that room and play with them, whatever, uh, do yeah. something else, you know. Sure. You've got a little jar of jelly beans there, maybe. Um, but yeah, you're, 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 you are very lonely in that little intellectual space. Yeah. Um, but then also sometimes, you know, just wrapped up in the beauty of the thought. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's, uh, I, I found a lot, I spent a lot of time reading. Uh, I can't write unless I read. I'm just one of these, that's just my process. And I, I've read mostly novels, read probably about 150 novels in the, co in the process. And there's something about being in dialogue, you know, with great uh, writers that even if you don't know how it's going to turn out, like, I, again, I didn't know if it was going to be published or not. I, I thought maybe I'd have a shot, but I, I just wanted to finish it, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and that was really what I was after was to finish it, make it something that I loved. Uh, and there's those great moments when you feel like you're in dialogue with, say, Toni Morrison or something, or mm -hmm. you're in dialogue with um, uh, uh, people who uh, put these things across the page that you thought were so beautiful uh, and enchanting and mysterious. And and then you 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 have a certain day, and it happens once every three weeks, maybe. You know, 80% of the time it's just drudgery. 10% of the time it's like almost impossible, and 10% of the time it's like Hey, all right. And then it's one of those good days when you've really got, you know, 1200 words of just, and you're like, God, that was, I was in it. And there's not, there's nothing, there's no feeling like that. And I'm saying that as someone who's, you know, I, I played a lot of rock and roll shows in front of lots of people and had great fun doing that as well. But it's, there's something about being in dialogue with your mind across ages with other people whose minds are in dialogue with you. And as soon as you sit down to write that book, you become part of it. And there's mm -hmm. something very special about that that I don't think exists um, in music. Do you feel that that writing memoirs, or writing this memoir for you, was more therapeutic than writing in general? I mean, probably. And I say that because um, that isn't why I did it. It was, but it, it was a side effect, I think. Uh, for a couple reasons. Um, the first of which is, of course, when I was writing it, um, I didn't think about that there would be an audience. Again, I, I didn't know if I was ever even going to get a book deal or anything. I just was sitting there writing. Um, and it didn't occur to me uh, how personal it all was. I just knew it was like if you scratch certain places, the writing felt more alive, right? You know, it's like uh, George Saunders' idea about just like, um, is, is it alive on the page? Is the writing engine, are you engaged? Is it, can you feel life on the page? And as soon as you don't feel life on the page, move on. It's not good, you know? Uh, and there was just more life in it when I was writing in ways that I felt were a little, um, uh, um, where I was sharing more about my actual sort of experience and my inner mo sort of monologue about, about what was happening around me. Um, and so I just wanted the story to be as good as it could be. And then about, Two weeks before publishing, um, I had this moment where I went, holy shit. <laughs> like, dude, everyone's going to read this. Everyone's going to know all my secrets. I don't, I'm not going to be secret. And I, and I was so nervous. And it seems like you're probably about to go through this process. So um, I, I couldn't sleep. I thought everyone's going to hate me. Everyone's going to think. There's the fears about just like, everyone's going to think you're a horrible writer, which every writer has. But there's also this additional fear is like, for some reason, if people know your secrets, they're going to hate you, which of course is the opposite. When people know your secrets and they see you struggling and they see you working it out and they see you being honest with them on the page, they appreciate that. They really, the reader really knows, a good reader knows when you're full of shit. And so you got to give them, you know, you got to give them your actual heart, your actual mind so if you're doing that then you know they, they come along with you but it doesn't feel that way so mm -hmm. that was our two weeks before public publication date and i'm talking to my wife every day like i don't know what's gonna happen and she's like it's a good book don't worry and i'm like i just know and then it came out and then here's the therapeutic part i just kind of felt like well 
Eh, I guess everyone knows everything. Right. <laughs> nah, I don't really have any secrets left to tell. Yeah, everyone knows all the messed up stuff about me. And then there's this weird thing that happens where um, there's, and I talk about this in the book a bit about building masks that you present to the world. Um, and that part of people who grow up in certain circumstances, maybe you've, uh, uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to put this to you in a minute, actually. But um, where uh, I felt like I didn't have to put a mask. I could just, uh, I, everyone sort of knows the truth. So my honest intellectual or emotional reaction to something is just kind of fine. Uh, and um, it was kind of a relief. So I guess there was some some therapy in that. And I, I wonder if you, um, you know, knowing what your um, your background is and having grown up in a cult, did you find uh, that there's moments in your life when you stopped wanting to answer the question of uh, questions about childhood and you would dodge around bringing up the cult because you just didn't like the way people looked at you when you said I was in a cult or something and you wanted them to look at you as a important writer or as a, as a scholar, or I don't know, as someone on a date, I don't know, or out with friends without having to bring the heaviness of the, all the stuff that the word implies uh, with you. Absolutely. I mean, like, you know, two things came to mind when you were saying that one was that, um, you know, my kids are adults now, but uh, in their twenties. Um, but one of the things that they would always laugh about is that people would, when people would bring up the cult thing, other people would often say, she seems very normal. <laughs> they would kind of laugh yeah, because yeah. if you lived with your parents, you know, whether they're normal or not. Right. <laughs> yeah. And they did not, not, it, you know, there was no doubt in their mind that mom is not normal. Um, and so I would feel uncomfortable with that. Yeah. Laugh. You know, I yeah, didn't like them around because I wanted people to say, I liked it when people said she seems normal yeah. because it meant that I had successfully, I was successfully wearing the normal mask. I absolutely know what you mean. I absolutely like, yeah. You're, it's like, how was your childhood? And you go, I was, it was good. You know, where'd you grow up? you know, kind of different places, uh, yeah. but, you know, Salem, Oregon, went, oh, what'd your mom do? Or what'd your dad do? Yeah. Oh, you know, she worked in mental health, you know, or my dad, you know, he's, he's a mechanic. Oh, that's a yeah. good job. Uh, you can get with a night with a, just a high school education or, you know, and well, he never went to high school. Oh, why didn't he go to high school? Well, see, he started running drugs when he was 15. Wait, he started running drugs. When he was, well, what happened? How do you meet your mom? If she's a college master's degree, well, they met in this call. And then the next thing you know, you're going down this hole and you're like, <laughs> eject, yeah. you know, the whole thing is like going towards this thing where you, you, you suddenly, you can see them formulating in their mind, yeah. like, Oh, this is an other. Yeah. And you feel otherized. And yes, I yes. think as as people who have children or people who are in their fully in their careers, I don't give a shit now. Right, right. But at fifteen, yeah, I did I mean, not want that attention. I did not right. want that designation. And so I, right. I'm with you. I was all about let me. How do I create a mask? And how can I then formulate a character that is a that will win the approval of whatever audience I'm addressing as a fifteen year old whether it's my girlfriend or my girlfriend's parents or my teachers. Uh -huh. or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. For some reason, when I was dating in college, you know, people, you know, there would be this, you know, when am I going to meet your parents? And at that point it was like, my parents were alive well and 38. And it was like, you're never going to meet my parents. And, you know, I was living on the Eastern seaboard. They lived on the Eastern seaboard. You're never going to meet them. And that was difficult to explain. You know, yeah. one yeah. of them is still on the call. And, um, yeah. One of the things you address in this um, book, you, you really, it feels like in a way it flickers all the way through the book is something that, that Cornell West uh, writes about. So Cornell West has an essay that I, I taught a lot for the 25 years that I was teaching undergraduate that's on parenting. And in, in his essay, he basically argues that the boys need fathers. I mean, it, it, I think that's the sort of, thesis of his argument and that he had a father and that that's part of his, what made him who he is. And in fact, I will say that my students argued against that because most of my students who were reading the essay were raised by their mothers and grandmothers and felt that they were doing just fine. Thank you very much. And yeah, they would argue against his thesis, but I don't think his thesis is entirely wrong. You um, I feel you thread through this idea of, of manhood in America and and boys boys needing to know who their father is. And 
you know, because as a, as a person growing up, I didn't meet my father until I was 19 and really have only seen him in my whole life, like four or five times and had a lot of curiosity about him. Sure. Um, I, once I got divorced from my kid's father, when the, my kids were three and five, I bent over backwards to make sure that they would know exactly who their father was. And he would, he would share custody and all of that, because I was not going to repeat my mother's mistakes. Um, because I felt that particularly my son would need to know exactly who his father was. And, and it worked out well. I'm, I'm very pleased to say, you know, my, my ex is very much part of my life and knows his children. But you were very clear in this book that, that you needed to know who your father was and that that shaped you. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about that, 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 that need to know, for better or for worse, who your father is and how that makes you become a man, I think. Yeah, for better or for worse is a good way to put it. Um, I think in many ways I grew up, I didn't go to live with my dad until I was uh, 11. And of course, for the first many years of our lives, we were in the orphanage in the cult and we didn't know, really know either of our parents. So there's, there's a way that I knew him at some point and I didn't know him at all at another point. And then there was these intervening years where we had essentially a single mother um, and there is something about being the son of a single mother. Like I feel whatever um, uh, you could say about my mom uh, and her sort of difficulties as a parent, I always felt such sympathy for her just being a single mom. And I still feel that way about single moms. If I meet single moms, I feel like I, those are, uh, those people are going through more than you realize. And yeah. as the son of a single mother, you can't help but know that. Mm -hmm. And you get this sense of the power that a man has over her in a way that you don't quite understand as a six-year-old. Why is she blushing? Why is this? My mom's, you know, master's degree from Berkeley, uh, very smart, educated, uh, and in, in her way, a uh, powerfully spoken person, even though, you know, she's got some is other issues that, you know, I get into in the book. Why is she blushing? Where's all this sudden girlishness coming from? What is this? what does this affect and what is it that these men represent? And then of course your head immediately goes to like, and am I going to become one of those men? And then you hear, you know, we would overhear conversations of our mother upstairs talking to one of her friends and just about, well, you should date a man. You should find a man. Is he a good man? Will he be a bad man? Will he be one of the good ones or the bad ones? And immediately you start thinking, well, am I going to be a good one or a bad one? And what is that going to mean? And then what kind of power is that going to give me? And what should I do with that power? And what is the maternal fantasy my mom has of what I should do with that power? And then what is the sort of masculine thing that I'm, I think I'm supposed to do with that power. And it's just this absolute hall of mirrors. Um, so having said all that, um, my dad uh, was a very masculine man in terms of like, he liked football. He'd been in prison. He'd done a lot of heroin. He liked old cars. You know, he smoked and drank for forever. It was funny and quick. And, you know, I don't know if mas funniness is a masculine trait, but that's just part of who he was. He was also funny. Um, but he was also very warm and he was very kind. Uh, he was uh, very affectionate. He hugged and kissed us and told us he loved us and made us the center of his life. Uh, when um, when my mom, Bonnie, who she's my stepmom, but we don't use the S word in my family, became uh, very successful in business when she started to do well at her job, he quit to stay home and was fine with that because she had the bigger income and just always would, it was just proud of her and thought she was great. So in his own way, I think, you know, there's a kind of classical feminist in there somewhere. <laughs> I don't think he would ever say that, but I think there was, um, and a very warm guy. And, and our mom was actually quite cold. So the effect it had on us, you know, was to soften us to some extent, which you'd think it would be the opposite, but he actually was the one who softened us and the one who made us sort of, I think, more my brother and i both you know have families now and we both have children and we both love our kids very much and are very affectionate with them and they're the center of our lives and i think you know got that you know from our dad um at the, as to the question of whether boys need to know their fathers i i think there's plenty of fathers that probably don't need to know honestly um I and i think there's I plenty of uh mothers who probably are doing just fine uh, without, you know, just a man or, I mean, I don't think the man himself matters. I think you need to know your parents. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's important to know, you know, and, and you can't help but care because these are the people who, you know, mold you so much. Um, you mentioned Tony Morrison, who's, who's definitely one of my favorite authors as, as well. And one of the things I really admire that she does in her novels is 
I feel like she walks around to the other side of the room and tries to see everything from another, from everybody's perspective. Yeah, like the opening of Song of Solomon. <laughs> let's right. let's just see this event from everyone's perspective. Absolutely. Right. right, and she's she's just so masterful, bluest eye, of course. Um, and I feel that you um, really worked to see um, the world from your parents' perspective. Um, interestingly. Um, at the cult where I grew up, we also killed rabbits and ate them. And I'm so, so sorry. It's the worst. Uh, it's terrible. the worst. It's we like a big rat. Too. It's a cute rat. It's a big cute rat. That's all it is. Yeah. We killed <laughs> chickens and ate them too, but chickens do not feel the same as rabbits. Rabbits, yeah. oh, Lordy. It's stuck in your throat. <laughs> yeah. Um, the fur of them, the ears of them, the nose of them. Um, um, I'm Tony. Uh, I'm sorry. Was there a question in there? I wanted to no, talk yeah, about Tony so Morrison. The, the question in there the was. The question just could just be, like, can you talk about Tony Morrison for a while? And I'd be like, yes, I can. I love Tony. Yeah, yeah, we could just we could just keep going on Tony Morrison. But I I was curious as you worked to, I mean, I think it's like I also worked to see the world from my parents' point of view, and I think that that was probably the most difficult thing because. Yeah you know, you're, you're in your own life. And part of, after I'd had children, it was even harder for me to think, because in my case, like when I was three, my parents, you know, were done raising me and, and never raised me again. And so when I, when my daughter was three, I couldn't imagine being done with her. Totally. You know? Yeah. And, and so when you had had children, you, you know, I'm sure you you had some of those same thoughts, like yeah. you know, what were my parents thinking? You know, what was my mother thinking? Yeah. And 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 yet, it seems to me that you, it, you know, very skillfully tried to see the world from their point of view. So, you know, was that was that work on your part? You had to get inside. Yeah. Uh, the There's so many juicy topics on this question that you set you set up such wonderful things to talk about. Like, uh, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, <laughs> um, the the question of seeing things from their perspective. Um, I, I worked very hard to um, uh, try to write about difficult relationships with great love. Uh, and there's a there's an analogy. I keep quoting Mary Carr, but she's such a she has a wonderful book about memoir writing, um, and it's very quotable. And uh, I think the story is uh, there's a if you hear an anecdote, there's a man and he's got a bag of oranges and he comes home to a family and he eats all the oranges himself and he doesn't share it. And you're like, and if that's all you, if that's all the information you know, then you know, then you think, oh, this guy's, you know, um, not a good uh, father, and you know, uh, and if you know one more piece of information, which is that he has scurvy, and if he doesn't cure that scurvy, he can't go, you know, to work or whatever he has to do to support the family, then you see um, maybe a little bit more about why he ate all the oranges, and then you understand him a little bit more. And Mary Carr's advice is to always look for the scurvy. And it's not that you don't aren't entitled to your own perspective. You absolutely are. And it's not that you're not entitled to your own feelings, more so, I'd say. It's that um, it's important to understand what people were going through, because that's the reality of it. And my mother, who was mentally, had dealt, dealt with issues with mental illness uh, and severe depression, and was not, um, I, I would say, I think she would even say, uh, not a great parent to us. She wasn't able to be. you know. But then here she was. Her mother was a severe drunk, uh, abusive. She was raised by nannies, abandoned a lot of her childhood, definitely traumatized. Um, grew, uh, went to this cult, uh, joined it to save the world. It was a drug-free place. Met at this very charismatic, warm guy, my dad. They got married. Uh, and then the cult be went nuts and got violent and was crazy. And she had to leave. She lost all her friends and she lost all her money. And there she left, you know, penniless with two kids she hardly knew uh, with a shaved head, you know, uh, and there's a dilemma there. And sure, you could say, sure, she made some bad decisions. We've all made some bad decisions and not paid so high a cost as she did. And mm -hmm. would she have been a good parent without that situation? Yeah, probably not. But because uh, she did deal with some pretty difficult um, mental illness issues. But but to see the, the scurvy for her uh, was that, you know, she was really, really ostracized you know, in the cult because she wouldn't abort me. She was really, really, um, she really was broke. They really did take all her money. Uh, and she really did have a shaved head as this woman trying to get a job and raise two kids in, you know, 1980. 
and we really did have to live on the run because people were trying to hurt us. That's a that's a dilemma for anyone. And you could take the person who had maybe, you know, didn't have the issues of mental illness that she had and put them in that situation. And that's a that's a tough situation. And so I think it's important to find empathy. I, I just want to add one more thing, which is that empathy is important for people who have hurt. Um, I wouldn't say I've hurt you. Let's say empathy is important for the whole world. It's important to see people's you know, scurvy. However, I will say, I think our, our society puts too much emphasis on the idea of forgiveness. I think that it's always like this vaunted state that you can reach. Like if you can just forgive the people who hurt you. Now forgiveness requires, you know, um, people to have contrition. It requires people to admit, to have the ability to even see and reflect upon and admit the things that they have. And then for you to have gone through the uh, ability to hear that and understand that. And, and, and also, uh, it, it feels like the wrong question, I guess, is what I'm driving at. Um, this question of blame and forgiveness. People want to feel like they've they've reached a new plane in their humanity because they forgive. And, and I think that's the wrong question. The question is simply, it's much more basic than that. And the question is not, can you forgive? The question is, how do you live now? Mm -hmm. How do you live now? Now that you are you and you're responsible for you and maybe you have kids. And so that means you're responsible for some other people too. And maybe you have a spouse or people in your life you love, so you're responsible for them. How do you live now having been hurt by this person? And what does that mean in terms of the boundaries you have to set, your emotional understanding, the work you've done on yourself to think about like, how am I gonna, how am I interrogating this so I, I'm not hurting my own children or my own relationships or whatever. And forgiveness and blame are kind of like irrelevant. Mm -hmm. You gotta figure out how to live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can you live with grace? Yeah, I don't know. Grace, <laughs> I come from punk rock. Grace is not high for me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I, I do, I do give give it a little thought from now now and then. Um, I, I saw my mother thirty three years after after I left, and uh, gave some thought to meeting her with with grace. Oh well, that um, yeah, that's good for you. That sounds like something you wanted to do for yourself, and that's that's a positive thing. I guess what I mean is, oftentimes people will not just acknowledge the actual hurt and anger that they have because they're trying to rush to this point yes. of forgiveness yeah. and don't, don't rush over those hold right. have the anger fully right. have the anger fully have the hurt acknowledge it and right. you know, that knowing that it's there and not just sort of rushing by it is uh, i think is actually a very important part of it I, I like what you said about forgiveness too because um um you know my mother is is dead now too but um when I, um, uh, when I was, when I saw her, one of my friends said to me this, that he gave me some advice about the forgiveness too, because I kept thinking that forgiveness somehow meant that it was okay, what she had done. Right, right. And, <laughs> right, because, you know, I sort of still had weirdly the yeah. biblical idea of forgiveness, like your sins are washed away or right, something. Right, right. And my friend was like, no, it just means that you are not carrying around that pain. Yeah. Yeah. That's all this means here. Um, so um, we're going to see if our audience has any questions for us. Um, so one uh, one of the questions that that I think a lot of people have been interested in is that you you start off inhabiting one age and and you do that so so masterfully and then you move into other ages. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um so uh, back to the idea of like classical memoir um, versus modern sort of literary memoir and treating memoir with the respect of the form um, that the form deserves. Uh, I guess I felt that um, I wanted to have a book that had magical realism. I wanted to have a book that had unreliable narration. I wanted to have a book that was rife with metaphor. I wanted to have a book that was sort of steeped in a kind of ontological reality cutting into a sort of stark uh, reality. Uh, and that these sort of, these are the kind of the devices of literature, right? Um, uh, and I think my, my argument was that, you know, these aren't the devices of fiction. These are just the devices of how we construct our identities. 
uh, and that we are the unreliable narrators of our own lives. We grasp onto totemic and totemic and magical uh, objects. And oftentimes, particularly as a kid, uh, the reality doesn't quite capture the how large the moment felt. So uh, what I wanted to do was to put the reader right in my head uh, at say five years old in these overwhelming moments. Uh, and it didn't feel like that could happen without some magic. Mm-hmm. Um, it, Cause that's how it felt mm-hmm. at five. And I think we forget that, you know, those of us who are adults now <laughs> that you, that so much of childhood is a, is a mystery of what's real and what isn't uh, and uh, what, where does the real world end and um, my mind begin. And so I wanted to have um, a book that, that, treated memoir with those exact same um, devices because uh, then it would more likely capture what the actual events felt like and therefore tell the story uh, in a more honest way. I thought it was more honest that way to, And also I thought, you know, you wholeheartedly believe the things that people tell you when you're a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, just like, you know, you have an unreliable narrator in a book and over time you learn that it was a lie. And it didn't make sense to just say, hi, I'm four years old, exposition, opening paragraph. I am now looking back at my life and um, here's some things I didn't know about it. And some people do that and it's fine. Right. Uh, the people I really respect are the people who do that uh, and then and then interrogate how they're doing that, which I think like Tara Westover did that really, really well and educated. She, she presents this thing in this kind of detached expository way, but then she also interrogates why she thinks what she's thinking and unpacks it. And, and, and I have a lot of respect for that. It felt more alive to me on the page um, to just be in it um, mm-hmm. and to allow and have the voice capture uh, what it felt. Now, how did I go about doing that? Um, is a whole other question, but I don't know if that's what you were asking <laughs> or not. Well, no, I um, I think that um, the way you know the way it's written um, allows the reader to inhabit the space because that I was, think that, yeah. that I think that one of the things that it's easy to forget, like because this is America, we're, we're fond of thinking, why didn't you just get away? And you forget that until you're 18, there is no getting away from whatever yeah. your situation is. Yeah. Um, so one of the things uh, when I was raising my kids, um, I had grown up without television and with a lot of animals. And so I raised my kids with no television. And we at one point had 50 pets. Uh, by the way, we live in the San Fernando Valley. We're not zoned for any animals at all, I think maybe except dogs and cats. Yeah. But we had um, a whole zoo at one point. Um, I'm curious how growing up as you did affects your parenting. Um, Well, there's the moment when you have a kid and you're forced to kind of reconstruct in your mind the kind of parents you had because you're now seeing the intensity of the love that you feel and the protectiveness and like, you know, the minute my son was born. Uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about all the things that could hurt him in the world. And my job was to protect him from those things, which I, is very common for people with infants. Uh, and I assume is a very hardwired instinct in human beings. Um, that protective instinct uh, to literally think through all the horrible things. Like you flash through, okay, on the way to the part, or on the way to the car, I could drop him and he falls down the steps and he hits his head. Okay, got to be very careful footed. Okay, and going into the car, he could decide to run in the street. I can't because then he hit by a car. Like you just imagine the, all right, there's a swimming pool next door. Is it locked? Can we make sure that he can't ever get into it? Like you go through all these horrific scenarios because you feel protective. And some somewhere around six months old, it occurred to me that was the age at which we were given up um, by our parents and we were put into an orphanage. And, and it's like, I'd always known that, you know, was true about our lives and I didn't really know how to feel about it. And I remember my son turning six months old and being like, what a, what a horrific, horrible tragedy this would be. This, Hmm. I, I like, you know, every day we we read stories and we do nap bedtime and we cuddle in bed before we falls asleep and we have our little jokes and we eat dinner and every every time he's sick I pick him up and we we have our little routines when he's sick and that's been true every day of his life and I just thought like they gave us up and they put us somewhere and where we didn't have uh, parents and we didn't know who our parents even were 
and I think as a as an adult, it hit me much harder than it ever had uh, growing yeah. up. Mm-hmm. So um, how has it affected my parenting? Um, I don't know. Um, I, I'm not the joiner my parents were. I think baby boomers were famously joiners. They, they I would like you could say you know uh, optimist or you could say naive. <laughs> I'm not sure which. I feel like Gen X, those of us, uh, Obama talks about this, where we're sort of the caretaker generation. We're all like, let's not lose our heads, okay? Let's. We're always a little skeptical. We're always a little like, I don't know about that, but this is this makes sense. So let's go try to do this because I think this could work. And then this. Yeah. So I feel like, um, you know, um, we um, we feel my wife and I both feel we just want our kids to you know have the best shot, and we want to be. You know, we don't want to be perfect parents. We want to be good enough parents. Uh, and, uh, you know, as long as they're safe and loved and, you know, educated, uh, that uh, they can just kind of marinate and love in our house, then they're going to turn out okay. That's that's our hope. It's it's weird. It's almost like this return to maybe, uh, I mean, it's very modern in some ways, I guess, but this kind of classical idea of child rearing where it's like, let's not do a bunch of experimental stuff. Let's just, let's just raise our kids. Let's just love right. them and take them to places like the zoo. Right, right. Yeah. I've spent a lot of time at LA Zoo, too. Um, so one of the things that, um, you know, I thought about a lot growing up was that, um, well, you know, what was my sort of safe place in my head? What, you know, I think that kids that grow up in a place that feels dangerous um, have created some sort of safe place for themselves. And um, you have this mechanism in the book of the room under Hollywood Park, but it feels like it's sort of a, a literary mechanism for the ways throughout the story where you've created some sort of safe place for yourself yeah. to, um, to stay whole in some way, because obviously you've, you've managed, you managed to, and then there's that moment where you say, I have figured out a way to get out and you're going off to college. Um, do you feel like that, that you you continue to have tools in your life that, that, that keep you safe? Or do you feel like the world feels safer to you now that you're away from? Oh man. It's <laughs> It's weird. Uh, what's that movie where someone's goes like, I don't know. It's just been so long since someone asked me how I was. <laughs> I, uh, we have two young kids. So I spend most of my time thinking about if my kids are safe mm-hmm. and what they're going through. I don't know if I have that in my, in my modern life. I, I will say the mechanism of the room is one of the high concept pieces. Uh, and I, and it's really like, you know, the book obviously has these four different perspectives for the four sections and one's a child and one's a, older child a preteen and one's an angry teen and one's an adult uh and the writing reflects that um and the room kind of runs throughout as does the stone tower runs throughout these are the safe havens uh that the that i go to or that and i was like third person i just when i talk about mm-hmm. like the man well as the chat that he goes through even though i'm talking about myself just because otherwise it's just too hard to separate the writing from the lived mm-hmm. experience or whatever um but the um the high concept um, uh, really, I think what it reveals in this particular case is that there's the perspective of the book is really, there is a dialogue happening between like the mind of an adult writer and the child. And I think that's that's the understanding on page one. Uh, like it doesn't actually sound like a five-year-old. Uh, at least I don't think so. I think what it sounds like is a writer approximating the emotional world of a five-year-old by using some syntax and also some sort of childish understandings, but then, um uh you know the 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 places that are constructed are kind of like these timeouts and there's a bunch of them in the book where yeah. it's like we're going to take a timeout uh, and i tried to think about this when i was writing the book that each scene had to operate on multiple levels and you know one was the reality of the details and what the visceral details of the moment were and then there was sort of like the emotional reality what does it feel like is happening and then there's a kind of spiritual reality like how how is this you know, changing the kind of arc and narrative of the characters in this moment. Now, how are they sort of relating? And then there's this kind of ontological, like, okay, and then what does that mean now for the Uber story of like where we're sort of heading as people or whatever? Um, and um, the 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 room was kind of like a piece of each of those things, um, because you know Hollywood Park itself was a place we felt safe. 
mm-hmm. uh, when we'd go there with our dad, it was like we had a parent, we had someone who cared about. So the emotional reality was, man, we just could have a day in the sun. We could close our eyes in a way that we never could in the cult. And we never could in Oregon. And, um, you know, we were safe when no one was trying to get us. No one was trying to hurt us. No one was trying to beat us. No one was trying to kidnap us. Um, and we were just kind of a day in the sun with our dad. And then, you know, what that meant was we felt sort of spiritually like these different beings, you know, we are on this okay. other plane, we get to be like other kids for a day. And then ontologically, it means that now this room, this place beneath Hollywood Park, now that my father is gone, is this place that has to exist in my memory, because it's the only place it can exist. But it still exists as much as it did before, because it's in my memory. And, you know, memory is at least as powerful as a story. And the story is as powerful as this book I'm holding in my hand. So that was right. the way I tried to think about it. Right, right. Um, I like that because, I mean, basically the the feeling of being safe is almost like feeling like you're a god because you um, most of the time don't feel safe. Yeah, um, yeah. It, was a, it was a new experience for us when that, whenever that happened, yeah. So in 2006, I think it was, um, I had written a libretto that was performed at Disney Hall. Oh, really? And, yes, and it was, it was a, you know, it's the Church of Music, and apparently you had music. I mean, you, you actually performed at Disney Hall, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, in, in the Cathedral of Music. So um, I was just sitting there watching other people sing, um, but you were actually there uh, on stage. So did you feel, did it feel like, um, you know, you're coming home like you, Oh, it uh, felt fancy. Like home home for me was like a dirty rock club that smells like beer and bleach. You know, those clubs where you go in and you can just feel the sweat and the beer and your foot sticks to the tile a little bit because of the beer from the night before. That's like, that's the kind of place I'd been hanging out for the last five years when I started the band. Cause you know, local bands in silver, like that's what you play, you know, or, Maybe you play El Cid or something. So you're playing next to the Mexican restaurant or you're, you know, playing South by Southwest. So you're just like in some random room while a bunch of A&R agents stare at you. But like the, um, the Disney hall felt fancy. It felt yeah, yeah. buttoned up. It felt like, wow, we got to put on our nice clothes. I'm going to yeah. wear the jeans with no rips tonight. Yeah, yeah. We're playing Disney hall. Uh, so it was, it felt rare. And we also brought a bunch of people in, uh, uh, where we um, we brought in like a whole high school marching band, uh, the Calder Quartet, who are themselves played play Disney Hall or World Class String Quartet played with us. And um, we had ballet folklorico dancers. We had artists in residence, a ton of guest musicians. And so we, we just, we made it kind of spectacle and sort of fun. So it was like the, I think for us, it was like, we were like, okay, what's an ideal night of music? And it's going to have elements of rock and roll and elements of, this beautiful classical music and elements of chorale. And, you know, um, we're going to put it all together into something that kind of celebrates the fact that we survived all this really, you know, dark stuff that we're singing about. Yeah. Yeah. I felt like I couldn't believe that a girl with dirty boots was allowed in the door, but then like, <laughs> yeah, right? They are, right. And they're just like, come right in. And you're like, really? Me? Really? Me? <laughs> yeah. That's great. Oh my God. Okay. I'll, I'll come right at the stage this way. Really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm fascinated about the loneliest girl and I want to hear some more about, about it. So, uh, who was more alone than Medusa? <laughs> I, I don't think anyone was, um, Medusa, <laughs> uh, so I, I wrote this book. It's just come out February 15th from the university of New Mexico press. And so I'm out on tour with it now and it is, a book that very much kind of follows the Me Too movement. Um, and it follows Medusa's story, but then it allows Medusa to rewrite her story. So the story of Medusa that we don't get to hear about is that the reason she was in the cave of Cisthene is that she was raped. And her punishment for being raped was being put into that cave and given the, the head full of snakes. And so I let her rewrite her story and and she gets a lot of different versions of the story. And some of them, she invites a lot of women to come and live with her. And some of them, she invites men and women to come and live with her, but she definitely takes back her power and rewrites her story in a way that women are taking back their power in the 21st century and, and rewriting our story. 
and I and I also kind of catalog all the things that have happened to women over the years. Um, the first poem in it is 10 Things You Need to Know to Be a Woman, a woman that's based on the, the 10 Rules of Dueling, which of course was based on the 10 Rules of Crack. And it's all the things that have happened to women sort of smashed into a poem that's pretty fierce and dark. And then I go through a lot of the different things that have happened to women and the ways that women have been shamed. Because in both Greek mythology and in the Bible, women are constantly being shamed. And so I wanted to go through all this shaming and find a way for women to write ourselves out of this shame and into a new story. And like this story of light is the story we write ourselves into, a story of wings, a story of light, a story when we get to to claim our own life. And so that's, that's what I work to do in this book. And it's, um, it was, it was a, it was a journey to a bottom of a well for seven years writing this. It felt very dark down there for a long time, but then I climbed back out, uh, as I, as I got to the end of the book. So, um, most you know, people don't know that the, the, the backstory of Medusa was that she was, is that something I just didn't know? I mean, I've never been a big classics person, but I feel like that, that puts this whole other light on it that, yeah. so, so the implication is she's a monster because somebody else did violence to her. And now what is, yeah. so what is that supposed to say about this kind of like, you know, this iconic figure for, you know, uh, femininity and at least in Greek mythology that like, she's this, she's monstrous now because she was damaged as opposed right. to you know, this isn't a choice that she made. Right, right. But yeah, there's also exactly. tremendous power though, right? Cause she's given, you know, there is something there about, she is given tremendous power. And so I, right. I'm curious how you think about that sort of contradiction there. Yeah, it is very contradictory because she has the power to kill, but yeah. she doesn't have the power to love. Yeah. And so I wanted to give her the power to make a choice whether she loves or not. And she doesn't have the power of life. She has the power of death. Mm -hmm. And um, so I wanted to give her the power of both. And in, in one of the lines of her poem, it, she's, she's talking about the men that visited her in the cave. And she says, it isn't true, they all died. Um, so, um, and, and the and last line of that poem is, imagine the men who found my lips. Um, and that, that poem is, uh, Hila Flitman put it, um, sings that poem and it's, it's available on YouTube and she's such a magnificent singer. Um, but, um, I, I really wanted to give women back voice power story. Yeah. Um, and, um, I mean, we have, we already have all this. We just need to walk out into the light with it. Um, and I think that that's part of what the, the this whole, the Me Too movement that's been building and building has been all about, but I just sort of wanted to I mean, we all have this. I just wanted to put some of it into writing. Um, so um, thank you so much for asking. Yeah, wonderful. It's been so great having this conversation. Oh, I loved it. Yeah. Um, I, I can't wait to recommend this book to a lot more people. And oh, thank, you. Um, thank you so much for being here today. And uh, I hope I get to see you again sometime. And looking forward to listening to your music. Oh, likewise, thanks for having me um, and really enjoyed the conversation and best of luck with the memoir. Yeah, oh my thank God. You so much.